All right. This first patient, I'll show you things not quite in order, but I do want to show you chronology. So this is June the 7th. And at that time, at least viewed in retrospect, there is a rather subtle opacity here in the left lower lobe. Perhaps not quite a full segment in size, but approximately. And then we'll go forward to 610. And inflation of the lungs is less. Really hard to determine whether it has changed or not or what might be going in there, going on there. But I'll bring up this one. So the time interval between these two is three days. So we have a substantial accumulation of left pleural fluid in that period of time. That's the dominant finding. So let me show you the CT done on the 10th. I'll bring that up alongside here. See the pleural fluid. So again, let me just get my timing. That's the 13th. So this is three days before when only a relatively small amount of fluid is present. And opacity is present in the left lower lobe. But a key image, relatively subtle, is here, where in the left lower lobe there is subtle, but a circumscribed area of lower attenuation right there, consistent with, in the face of an acute illness, a focus of necrotizing pneumonia or abscess. Let me show you the follow-up CT, which is on the 13th, and sorry about that, and that is present here. So this is a case that is nicely described as explosive pleuritis. Now there are variable definitions of explosive pleuritis, but in summary, a rapid accumulation of pleural fluid in a patient with an acute respiratory illness is very suggestive of infection. So here we have findings consistent with an abscess. The patient was treated with antibiotics. And here is some characteristics of the pleural fluid. Notably, the pH is quite low. So certainly consistent with a paranomonic pleural effusion. Presumably, this is a focal necrotizing pneumonia. But the case is a really nice case of so-called explosive pleuritis. I showed one many months ago in which this amount of fluid accumulated in about a day, 24 hours. This was in about three days to this size. But so-called explosive pleuritis in the context of infection. Pretty dramatic. Howard, why do you think the air is accumulating like that around the catheter tip instead of uh, traveling let's anteriorly? Let's see. Um, I don't know about the air in the pleural space. Was it introduced during the catheter placement and nothing more than that? But I don't know. I Maybe it made it just lost later. Hmm. Pardon? Maybe maybe they just there's pleural loculations trapping it there and preventing it from yeah. traveling materially. Yeah, perhaps yeah, right there, yeah. So a case of explosive pleuritis. Howard, I missed the organism. Did was it identified? No, nothing cultured yet, and perhaps never will, given the patient um, has been treated with antibiotics. At least not yet. I'd have to go back in time and and check out the. Uh, the medical record for that. Context is important here. This is a patient with long-standing AL amyloidosis. This CT is 2015, and I'm going to put alongside it this more recent CT from April. 
Now, she went on, her dominant clinical picture is cardiomyopathy ascribed to cardiac amyloidosis. Indeed, she underwent cardiac transplantation, as you can see here. An interesting finding is present in the lungs. So right down here, you can see that there are areas of evolving cystic changes in the lungs. I'll just make this one larger, particularly in the lingula. So let me show you the lingula where the lung tissue is disappearing. And also here, there are other smaller cystic spaces as well, but the disappearing lung tissue is primarily in the lingula and down here as well. And again, the lingula there, and that's new from before. So given that the patient has chronic amyloidosis, we have ascribed the loss of lung tissue, the acquired form of emphysema, to protein deposition in the lung. That's a very plausible and I think a very likely explanation. So um, I and other folks have shown cases like this before, cases of acquired cystic lung disease and indeed even larger areas of emphysema in the context. I remember Travis in particular showed one in a patient with very substantial pulmonary emphysema and he turned out to have amyloidosis. This is one of a number of articles one can find, which is not that one. And it is this one. And they described a patient with emphysematous lung lesions caused by amyloidosis. Um, not the same in distribution, but somewhat similar. Um, I don't think that they went far enough to describe the most prevalent explanation, which is protein deposition and the effect of macrophage-associated matrix metalloproteinases in degrading ground substance and acquired emphysema. But I think it's very plausible in this patient that it's due to that. Kind of interesting. It's not super severe. The rest of the lungs look okay. All right, here's my third case, which is really interesting. So let me show you two images. Well, let me start with this one, which is the most recent. Oh, uh, Howard. Is, yep. Can I perseverate on that last case? Yes. Um, have you seen Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia cause cysts and emphysema from protein deposition in the lung? Yes. From the, right. Smaller, smaller yeah, cysts. I think, I think you showed some cases of that. Am I correct? Yes, I think I may have shown one or, one of those. I think I might have two or so in my teaching file of Waldenstrom's associated with cystic spaces as well as a plethora of other lymphoproliferative disorders. Okay, I think I might have a Waldenstrom's case. Maybe I, I can dredge it up for next week, but thank you. Yeah, sure. So let me show you this interesting case and I'm not gonna tell you anything. I just want you to look at this, look at the opacities, small ones, multifocal, multi lobar now slightly larger these are interesting looking because they have lobulated and speculated margins more of the same so a multi lobar process here in the lingula where the opacities are larger and not quite spherical but irregularly shaped with perhaps a little bit of architectural distortion around them, esophageal hiatus hernia. So just by virtue of, well, let me show you years back to show you that not much has changed over time. So alongside here will be 2021, and you will see that they are present before. So what would you folks, or anyone willing to take a step, think about 
something like this that really hasn't changed over some years in an, in an elderly lady. Maybe a few more, a little bit, but clearly it's a chronic process and it's been there a long time. And these things are not really growing. And then I will, while you're thinking about that, go to the media style window. And let's scroll through and look at the look at the attenuation of the bigger ones. Here's one here. Yeah, that's that's fast. Cool. That's it. That's cool. Check that out. I, Howard, I showed a, a an exogenous lipoid pneumonia a couple of weeks ago. Okay. Presumed, we don't know, but I'm guessing that's where you're going with this. And she just exactly. happens to sleep laying prone, which is why she's aspirating anteriorly. Yeah, presumably in bed. So after we sort of made that diagnosis, we asked the physician to ask the patient again, and she ingests mineral oil each night. I don't know why, question mark laxative, but yep, that's exactly it. Okay, just another really classic, super cool case. Let me see if there was another one that showed the fat even nicer, one on the right side, if I remember correctly. Let's see if I can, oh, that one there. This one is cool, right there. The image is a bit noisy, of course, because these are one millimeter cuts, but you can get the idea, right? Do you think she lies on her tummy when she sleeps? I don't know, at least on her thigh or something. I'll bring up the, um, the numbers for you. Here we are, minus 140, minus 141 in there, thereabouts, that kind of stuff. I guess it's positional, David. Were they more anterior? It's pretty rare for adults to want to sleep on their on their on their stomachs, but um, I just encountered a patient this week. It's really surprising. Most people lie on their back or on a side, <clears throat> but her, most of her um, the stuff in her airways is anterior. So I'll bet you Travis is right. She lies on her stomach. The smaller we stuff is out there too. It's also anterior. Yeah. Here we can see how airway centric it is. There are a couple of little airways that traverse this opacity. So airway, airway centric abnormalities. Yeah, very nice case. That's impressive. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice one. All right, those are mine for this week. All right, thanks, Howard. All righty, so let's see. We had uh, Maya from UCSF, one of the new faculty there, had some pieces. Hello, thank Hello. you. So I'll just ask you if you want to share your screen and just make sure all patient information's hidden. There we go. Gotcha. All right, everyone able to see? Yes. Okay, so um, I've got a couple of cases. This is the first one. Um, so this is a 41-year-old uh, man who has a history of a thigh myxoid liposarcoma. And the patient has known metastatic disease. As you can see, right, they've had a prior osseous resection or vertebral body resection related to their metastatic disease. And this was a routine, you know, staging CT. And as we scroll through, I'm gonna draw your attention to the heart where we can see that there is at least a moderate pericardial effusion. And as I scroll back through the heart, you can start to see this oblong low density thing, structure that looks like it's either within or adherent to the inferior wall of the left ventricle. And there's another area of low density also sort of in the groove between the ventricle and the atrium extending towards the right um, ventricular wall. And I think you can see this even better here on coronal, where we see again these low density structures that appear to be within the wall of the ventricle. And if we come further, you can see that maybe there's a little bit of enhancement even um, outside of the ventricular wall. So, you know, we called this as very suspicious for intracardial metastases from this patient's liposarcoma. 
uh, which this is a first for me. I've never seen a myxoid liposarcoma metastasize to the myocardium itself. Uh, and we also did an MRI to confirm this. So I'm just going to scroll through quickly the short axis cine, um, right, where we see this intrinsically bright lesion sitting within the pericardium as well as pericardial fluid. And as we come further back towards the base of the heart, we see again additional areas of intrinsically bright soft tissue that is invading into the myocardium. Um, going all the way back along the wall of the ventricle, between the ventricles, as well as underneath the wall of the right ventricle, all the way towards the base of the heart. And this was all very brightly enhancing. Here we can see in our delayed imaging, all of that tissue there brightly enhancing, including that within the wall. So very suspicious for an intracardiac metastasis from a liposarcoma. I don't know whether anyone else on this call has seen that before, but this was definitely a first for me. Um, and then my next case, did, Maya, did you have, yeah. were there prior CTs where it was there were either prior not there CTs. or more subtle? Yes, we, exactly. So we definitely had some older CTs where much older ones that was clearly not there. And then some sort of in between where maybe this one stripe was there, but it was really hard to tell because it blended in really well with the um, pericardial effusion. So yeah, I think, especially if you're just sort of scrolling through this quickly on axial, it's I could see it being really easy to miss this particular thing and thinking that it's just part of the pericardial effusion. Um, but again, you can see a little bit of that enhancement even on the CT. So you know, is the presumption that the metastasis was bloodborne and that it lodged in the right ventricle and then got into myocardium and into pericardium? Is that your presumption? Yeah, I, I think so. I think that's sort of what we were suspecting, especially since the patient does have, you know, metastases elsewhere in the body. Um, I suspect that's probably what happened, but again, really uncommon. Um, and I think at this point, the patient is going for another round of chemotherapy and then possibly radiation therapy directly to this. So, you know, the, the, the notion of, of um, metastasis of the heart is actually fairly common on autopsy series, surprisingly common. I can remember reading about this, like 25% of people with certain cancers will have metastasis to the heart, but it's seldom diagnosed because it usually mm -hmm. doesn't doesn't progress to this stage and stuff like that. So it's not really detected while the patient's alive, but it's there at autopsy. So. Yeah. It seems like there's some, uh, can you show the uh, delayed enhancement images again? Yeah, of course. There's, there's, so yeah, there's like clearly tissue within the pericardial space yeah. as well. It seems like there's yeah. a lot of tissue in the pericardium and then mm -hmm. um, I think it could be extending from the pericardium up into the, and invading. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great thought as well. Yeah, whether this is started pericardial and then invaded into the heart versus starting in the heart and then extending into the pericardium. I think unfortunately we don't have a clear picture um, because it just sort of, on the prior CTs, it was much harder to see the pericardial component of it. Very interesting case. Was there, yeah. uh, were there other meds, does it, was it in the spine? Was there anything in the liver, anything adjacent to that? or? Um, I don't believe that they had had any of the liver. Most of the metastases were in the bones. You can see there were additional areas of, sorry, it's not the best image, but they had prior MRIs of the spine showing multiple um, spinal lesions. Um, I think they also had other osseous disease in the um, upper extremities as well. Um, and I think they also had, and I'm not sure exactly whether this was a metastasis or a second primary liposarcoma of the parotid gland. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. And then my next case. Um, is this one here. And so I'm going to start with this chest radiograph, um, which was one that one of my residents got overnight, um, where we can clearly see this sort of large mass like region. Um, abutting the right side of the mediastinum. You can still see mediastinal vessels through it. Um, and it looks like it sort of tapers out to this little line here um, towards the pleura. So I think given its proximity,
do the heart as well as its location concerning for something going on in the right middle lobe. Um, and actually, if we go back, if you hunt back far enough, um, there was a scoliosis series on this patient from three years before that radiograph, where if you look closely, it does look like they're starting to develop that density there already. Um, so that certainly raises suspicion for something that has been going on for a while, um, increasing in size over this time. So obviously we went to a CT. Um, and as we come down, we can see in the mediastinum a couple of, you know, mildly enlarged lymph nodes, but not huge. And then coming to the right middle lobe itself, we can see the right middle lobe is completely opacified. There's a lot of low density areas. Um, we see no patent airways. And if I switch to the airways view, we can see that the right main stem, or sorry, not the main stem, the right middle lobe bronchus is completely opacified and all of the airways distal to it are also opacified. And coming down, right, we see this area of more focal hypodensity with surrounding a little bit of enhancement. Now, whether that's atelectatic lung around it or whether that's true soft tissue enhancement, we're not entirely sure. So the patient went to bronchoscopy um, to evaluate what was causing this. Um, and I'm not sure if this is going to work, but are you able to see? Yes. Yep. Um, these were the bronchoscopy images that this patient had. Um, and you can see a large amount of this white, frothy sort of pus material. And then they found this little object um, in the bronchus. And I'm just going to switch to our pathology report. It turned out that this was a peanut. So this patient had presumably aspirated this peanut at least three years prior to this all happening. Um, and it had led to this complete obstruction of the um, right middle lobe, right? And so what we were concerned might be malignancy of some sort ended up just being an aspirated peanut. And this is their follow-up CT after they got all of that removed and all of the pus and everything behind it removed. And you can see, you know, the right middle lobe is atelectatic now and the airways are a little dilated, but they're open. Um, and they really have no severe, you know, residual from that. So very nice. Good result Excellent. for the patient. In retrospect, can you see the, the filling defect in the bronchus on the CT? Yeah. You know, I was trying to go back and see whether there was clearly a filling defect. And I think on this particular one, it's really hard. Um, right there? Yeah, it's probably somewhere in right, here. Yeah, right there. Because it should be low attenuation maybe right there, that. maybe. Yeah. Um, but that actually brings me to a companion case that I have to this one, which should be really short. Um, which is a very similar thing that happened um, to another patient. Um, and this one was a little bit more acute. So here is um, chest radiograph on the patient. Um, and you can see that there's collapse of the left, or at least a patient and collapse of the left upper lobe. Um, here's the same patient a year prior where you can see the left upper lobe is patent. Um, and obviously again, we got a CT. And here we actually see something high density sitting in the left upper lobe airway with collapse distally. And so again, patient went to bronch. Um, they went in and they saw an object sitting in the left upper lobe bronchus and they tried to extract it, but during the bronch, they actually lost it. They were pulling on it and it dropped somewhere. So they brought the patient back to CT immediately after. Um, and now we can see, sorry, um, that if we look further down here, that same high density thing has now moved. Um, yeah. And this was also, they went back and broke the patient again and were able to extract it this time. Um, and pathology on this one showed a bean. So yes, I agree, P you know, peanuts are oftentimes low density, but this one happened to be high density, this bean. So density may change. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Anyways, okay. those are my one, iron. one question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Hey Maya, sorry, uh, I'm not familiar with those cases. I think I've seen you pull them up, but um, uh, on the pathology, did they say anything about like an endogenous lipoid pneumonia? You know, they didn't. Um, I think for the, the for this second one, they really were just looking at the extracted um, lesion. But let me pull up the path from the first case, um, which I think went into a little bit more detail. Um, where no, I think that they just saw the material and then they saw inflammation um, and a little bit of, you know, 
yeah, again, areas of chronic granulation tissue and chronic inflammation, but they didn't talk about um, endogenous lipoid pneumonia. Though. It's a good question. So for that second case, they should use pulse therapy. <laughs> is pulse legume? Is that the is that the genus and species? Or yeah, I I assume so. That is what our pathologist put in there. <laughs> cool. All right, and those are my cases. Thank you so much. All right, who wants to go next? Can I sh show a couple quick? Because I'm going to have to get back to the reading room, and of course, one of them actually will go uh, nicely with the one the ones that Maya just shared. So, Maya, I think Maya's the first one to successfully use the radiant uh, viewer too. It looks like it works pretty well for yeah, PC. Yeah, works very well. Yeah, it worked okay. So I don't have a scoliosis film from years ago, but this guy also has process in the right middle lobe. And you can see, you know, just globally, there's volume loss on the side and you lose the right heart border some. Uh, and then the right, the lateral view does confirm that you've got this nice little band-like opacity corresponding to the middle lobe, indicative of, of middle lobe atelectasis. And this patient had I don't remember if they had just had cough or if they'd had a, a little bit of hemoptysis. Um, the other observation I think you can make here on the radiograph is it looks like there's something pretty dense there that looks calcified. And so this patient was referred here after the CT for a mass obstructing the bronchus. Uh, but as we've seen before, and as I see much more commonly here now that I'm in the southeast, back closer to histo land, that there is this coarsely calcified thing jutting into and obstructing the right middle lobe bronchus with some post-obstructive collapse. Uh, you know, certainly carcinoid tumors can calcify, but we have other calcified lymph nodes. And before David can ask about the spleen, I will show that it is indeed calcified or there are some calcifications in it. And this did turn out to just be a broncholith. I don't have a, um, I don't have a specimen or, or uh, image from bronchoscopy, but the, they tried to go in and debride it a little, but as you can see, maybe here you can see, there are a couple little bronchial arteries that are pretty friable around there. And so they chose not to really debride this and he ended up getting a right middle lobectomy. You know, at least anecdotally, when I was a fellow, there was a case where very similar, a patient had a, a broncholith and they had attempted to extract it. And the patient ended up having massive hemorrhage during the procedure and ended up with an oxic brain injury and died from it. And it's, you know, I was talking to the pulmonologist here, it's, it's a rare complication, but certainly they don't get too aggressive, especially if, it's, if there is any bleeding, because once these patients are, are intubated, their cough reflex, reflex is suppressed as well, and it doesn't take that much blood to to you know to clot in the airways and cause you know, significant hypoxemia. So nice nice correlate. This is you know just a broncholith, not a not a foreign body or a bean or anything. So and then this one is is more of a of an eye test on the radiograph. And so I'll show prior radiograph, and I, I can show a series of radiographs because this eventually came to us. But 2018, this patient has surgical clips. They have reduced soft tissue here from right prior right breast surgery. And their breast cancer was 20 years ago or something like that. So, uh, you know, not recent. But I will pull up then the first image earlier this year. And... See if people can spot the abnormality. If anybody wants to shout out what they see. Is there something in the subcranial space? Yep, good. So these were, these were all outside, but yeah, exactly. Okay. You could see right here, there's too much. And it's starting to splay the bronchi a little. I think that's one of the things. You can see the left main stem bronchus is, is a little bit, you know, it doesn't have that that kind of curvature to it, it now has more of a, of a convexity rather than a concavity, and you lose some of the azigo-esophageal interface here. Uh, but I'll show the lateral as, I can show laterals as comparison, because I think, especially with subcarinal space, you know, on the lateral view or the, 
you should have this inferior or infrahyalur window that's clear, but now you can see there's something in there and we don't really see the, the intermediate stem line or the posterior wall of the bronchus intermedius. But this was outside, um, not seen on that one. This is you know, a month later, and now you can see how much more splayed and how much more narrowed the airways are, how much larger the subcarinal thing is. And I think this is just a good illustrative case showing the evolution. Still on the lateral view, you can see that inferior hyalur window. And then finally came to the ED here and the airways are so narrowed, as you can expect, almost obstructed. And so here's the CT and no surprise, there's a huge subcarinal mass causing substantial narrowing of both main stem bronchi. Uh, so th this was diffed as METS versus a primary. You know, her primary was 20 years ago, as I mentioned. This actually turned out to be a squamous cell carcinoma primary you know, pr of the airway here. So not exactly sure what, you know, where this arose, but it was somewhere associated with the airways, so of, of lung origin. Uh, and, but just a nice, like, a, a good example of how things can evolve in the subcarinal space. And then the bonus, not really relevant in her case though, but you, know, you should never see a vessel in front of the pulmonary artery. And so she has an anomalous left main, which has a pre-pulmonic course. So not of hemodynamic significance in this patient, but if they were to ever consider doing a median sternotomy, obviously that would be the relevant information there just so they are not slicing through her left main coronary artery. But if this tumor is not surgically amenable at this point in time. So I will stop with that. All right, that's a great case. Travis, can you, can you show how the, uh, the LCX and LED come off that left main there? Sure. Yeah, I can show that. Yeah, it is it is the left main though, because you'll see the the circ comes off. There's motion, but it comes off right here, and then then comes back posteriorly, and then descends in the left AV groove. It's you know pretty wimpy circ, but you can see there's nothing. It comes close to the to the left coronary cusp, but it's not arising from it. And I th I think this is probably. SA nodal branch coming off right there, perhaps. Yeah, that's great. Okay, who wants to go next? I've got some cases. One quickie I'd like like a consultation on. All right. So I hope people can see this. Uh, abnormal mediastinum here on scout view. <clears throat> so there's something really bulky here, it's on both sides, it's bulging here to the right strongly and here to the left. And here's what it looks like on cross-sectional imaging. It's low attenuation, about 19 Hounsfield units. It's uh, fairly uniform, although there is a little bit of calcium that I'll show you farther down. Um, it seems to be predominantly on the right, does bulge to the left. It's hard to tell where it originates. Um, here's a little piece of calcium in it down here, just in one little area. But then here's the striking finding. There seems to be a small vessel going into this thing. So we don't know what this is. Uh, this person just presented here and the thoughts that were being tossed around were, you know, big bronchogenic cyst. I mean, you could say perhaps it arises subcarinally here it seems to be in front of the crina as well but um <clears throat> i was looking recently at a case that uh tan mohammed had sent of a a um, neurofibroma that had similar low attenuation this is a 22 year old woman his case was i think a 19 year old woman it was a posterior chest wall lesion it was very big but it also had this very uniform low attenuation of around 20 hounsfield units so I'm wondering if this might be some sort of a bronchogenic tumor. Um, uh, it's not I, a location for lymphangioma, but I would really appreciate your guys' thought on on this. My first thought was a plexiform neurofibroma. Okay. I've seen 
one that was in the in the root of mesentery and all through the abdomen that looked very similar and just infiltrated and kind of uniform attenuation of that of that appearance and uh, you know in that in ton's case there was an mr study and that was very useful because despite the homogeneity that you had on ct it actually had a lot of internal structure it was not uniform at all so so we're lobbying for an mri but it hasn't happened yet but i you know i saw this thing i thought this looks like a neural tumor to me and then the ton case came up independently this week uh, when i was showing it to to our residents and that sort of uh, really promoted the idea. So I'm very glad to hear you say that. Anybody it, else have to sense it's sort of centered right paraspinal and it's just expanded outwards in every direction. Yeah, and then at one point there, it looked to me as if maybe there's a little communication here. And that, but I couldn't really nail this as a as a neural tumor, you know, by any of the. No, know, I, I mean, I, and I think lymphangioma is another good thought. They can. The fact that it's, it's whatever it is, it's probably very slowly growing and has been there for some time, given how big it is. Um, yeah, and it, it's Dude, got to come scroll, out probably one way or the other. If you scroll to the top of it, uh, it has a very broad interface with the. Um, you keep you keep going up. Yeah, like right there has a very broad, even higher up. Has a very broad interface with the uh, paravertebral region. So that to okay. me means like it's probably growing from the from the chest wall. So I, yeah, I mean I agree. It, I agree with the nerve sheet. Excellent. I, okay. I, I like this for lymphangioma too because it, it looks like it's kind of going through multiple spaces, right? Like the yeah. anterior, the middle, and posterior mediastinum. And you know, MR can be really striking in in yeah. lymphangioma. Sometimes there's just a ton of internal structure that you can't see at all on CT. Okay, guys, I'll keep you posted. It's, it's, we're going to have an answer um, soon, and I'll let you know. Thank you for your help. Cool. All right. Who was the other person who wanted to show a case? I, I had some cases. Who was that? I'm sorry. Mr. Oh. Mr. Yeah. Okay. yeah, sorry. There we go. Okay, so can you see my screen here? Yep. Okay, um, so it's getting to be that time of year when, uh, you know, uh, the, the these are more, uh, the first two cases anyway, mainly for trainees, um, when a new set of trainees starts uh, independent call. And so um, it's good to know some of the main things to look for, some of the scary diagnoses that you are supposed to um, hopefully detect and uh, prevent um, any worsening of the patient's condition. And so this uh, patient has a history of uh, uh, blunt injury, uh, high-speed motor, motor vehicle collision. And so one of the most important things to take a look at on any trauma case is, of course, the thoracic aorta. And um, if we you know, if, it's really easy to kind of scroll and, oh, you know, everything looks fine. Um, or let's say you have the uh, window and level setting um, kind of uh, using a narrower window. Um, it's really easy to miss aortic injuries. So it's important that you are uh, windowing appropriately and kind of going pretty slow and um, paying attention to anything that you might find in the aorta. And so here, what we see is this little tiny uh, filling defect at the aortic isthmus, uh, kind of juxtaposed against the uh, wall there. Um, and so this, in the setting of trauma, and given that the patient doesn't really have, um, you know, any other areas of atherosclerosis, um, this is of suspicion for a minimal aortic injury. And so minimal aortic injuries don't really require any um, uh, imaging follow-up or uh, any emergent intervention or anything like that. Um, now, if you have um, injuries that have, you know, an intramural hematoma or dissection flap or something that's over one centimeter, then those are kind of placed into the moderate aortic injury category. And so those go for semi-elective uh, thoracic uh, 
uh, endograft placement, and then um, anything that has extra luminal contrast or you know really um, severe injuries um, may need emergent uh, uh, T bar placement. And so um, again, uh, it's important to take a look on um, different planes and make sure that the window settings are appropriate. So let's go to our second case here. So this is another case of uh, trauma. And so, whoops, let's go to this one. So here we can see that there's this um, uh, abnormality here, again, at the aortic isthmus. And so, you know, why do I keep showing cases with um, aortic injuries at the isthmus, um, about 65 to 70% of injuries, aortic injuries occur here at the aortic isthmus um, and other areas where um, they occur more commonly is uh, at the aortic root where the AOS kind of tethered to the heart. And here, um, the reason it's uh, so common is because you have the aorta kind of tethered by the ligamentum arteriosum. And then of course, another location where you may see Injuries is here behind the heart and the um, cruise of the diaphragm. And so here, if we go through this kind of, uh, you know, uh, only on the axial plane, it's easy to kind of just pass this off as, uh, well, I guess you, you may consider, you know, calling this a pseudo aneurysm, but um, looking on the, oh, let's see here. So if we go really carefully and kind of scroll carefully through this area, we'll see that there's also an abnormality on the other side of the wall here. And so rather than representing um, just a pseudoaneurysm, this uh, is kind of concerning for a transaction. And so if, you know, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the sagittal images pulled up, but um, on the sagittal images, they show that um, this kind of looks like, you know, those medieval battle axes where you have kind of a double-sided axe. If you ever see um, that kind of appearance on the sagittal, that's concerning for transection. Um, and again, you'll notice that this patient also has a lot of mediastinal hemorrhage here um, and a left pleural effusion, probably some complex elements in there representing blood. And so we've clearly got a theme here. Um, that's the hint for this case. So this is a patient who had um, interstitial lung disease, um, uh, IPF, and they got transplanted. And so when we're assessing um, lung transplants, let's see, uh, you know, of course, we want to look at the airways, make sure that the airways are patent, the bronchial anastomoses are patent. Um, you know, a couple of weeks to a couple of months, you may be worried about um, or, or that's when most commonly you, you may see airway complications such as bronchial dehiscence or um, bronchial stenosis start to develop. And so here the airways look good. We do our standard you know, evaluation of the lungs. We see that there's uh, lots of consolidation, clustered nodules here and there. So um, acute rejection versus infection. Um, there's a little tiny pneumothorax there and we've got pleural effusions. And you know, there's a lot going on on the CT, and it's a lung transplant CT. We're focused on lung transplant, uh, evaluating the lung transplant. But it's also important to understand that, uh, you know, for any surgery, what are all of the different things that are done to the patient? Um, and so I will leave it on this image here, this first uh, CT, and then on the second CT, I'll leave it um, on that image. On the third CT, I'll leave it right there. And can anybody, um, does anybody want to take a guess as to what I'm trying to show? Pledge it on the ascending aorta, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, so there's a, there, there's a little felt pledge here. And if we take a look at this exam, you know, it looks like that felt pledget is closely approximated to the anterior margin of the ascending aorta. But then on this exam, this area is kind of, everything starts looking a little amorphous. I don't know where the, you know, I can kind of, I guess, guess that the anterior margin of the ascending aorta may be somewhere here. And the question is, why does the felt pledget look uh, displaced more anteriorly? And so this was, I think, eventually picked up. And 
here's the contrast enhanced CT, and we see this large uh, pseudoaneurysm here at the um, ascending aortic cannulation site. And so for um, you know several types of cardiac or pulmonary surgeries, patients are placed on um, intraoperative cardiac bypass. And so one area that the arterial cannula plugs into is the ascending aorta, and then another area is usually the right atrial appendage. Um, uh, and so it's always important to take a look at those two sites to check for any sort of um, bypass-related postoperative complications. And so this is, you know, how, how many CTs um, of lung transplant, you know, if, if you're at a busy lung transplant center, it's easy to really, uh, you know, focus on the lungs and kind of um, not really pay attention to the, the mediastinum and, you know, because low pretest probability of anything going wrong there usually. Um, but again, important to understand what happened in the operating room and kind of apply that knowledge to your research pattern. And that's my last case. That is a fantastic case, and thanks for sharing that combination of cases. All right. In the context of lung transplantation, I'm thinking, are they placed on cardiopulmonary bypass? At least not in, not in my experience. Is there something about this patient that that what was done? You I'm not aware of that. Was sequential without, without cardiopulmonary bypass, right? It's odd. Yeah, I'm not sure if they uh, if some, there was some other reason for that, but that's uh, you know that's I guess one of the issues here. Mm. Uh, Peter or anyone else? I got until one. All right. Yeah. You, you, yeah. I, I can go later. Go ahead, Brian. Oh, Brian, right, you go. You. Yeah, yeah. I got uh, a couple quick ones. Sure. Um, so let me share my screen. Thank you. All right. So you guys should see a chest CT, and hopefully all patient info has been removed. Um, so this is a young woman with a significant past medical history of autoimmune disease. Um, uh, she has multiple problems, including I think lupus and uh, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And then there's also a family history of uh, autoimmune disease. Her mother has Sjogren's and her grandmother has rheumatoid arthritis. And as we scroll through the chest CT, we see uh, multiple bilateral, um, almost central lobular ground glass and consolidative density nodules. Um, there's maybe a, a slight upper lobe predominance, but not, not, not particularly. Um, and uh, we have serial CTs on her over uh, the course of about a year, and they seem to be getting worse. Um, she did have COVID previously and now has COVID again, actually, but um, that was preceding the most recent CT. So this is uh, about a year ago, um, just showing some, this is before she had COVID, um, some patchy ground glass. Um, patient denies vaping, um, no uh, works in healthcare, no allergic exposures. So I wasn't sure what, what to make of this. Um, I thought this might be a good look for uh, GL, ILD, um, but that's such an odd, uh, unusual one today. I wanted to see if anyone else had any of the other ideas. She's got anti-phospholipid antibodies? Correct. And uh, Henry, Henry, a, the, a strong the, family uh, history of yeah. autoimmune disease. Well, in the anti-phospholipid antibody syndrome, one pulmonary hemorrhage is an unusual but well-described phenomenon. Hmm. Was she SLE any also? I, I believe so. Um, yeah, she has lupus and her mom has Sjogren's. Um, so there's an entity lupus pneumonitis, which is kind of just a wastebasket, I guess, nonspecific pneumonitis that's associated with with lupus. Yeah, it looks like kind of a exclusion. I, I, I'm not sure, but I think she had a bronch and it was negative for, for heme. Um, but that's, that's a, a uh, those are great thoughts. Um, does anyone think this could possibly fit with GLILD? I, I've, I've seen such so few cases, but I, I mean, thought that the... Is the spleen big? That's usually one of the findings that supports that diagnosis. Mm, Not particularly. It's a little big. Yeah. He's kind of a big person. 
Yeah, and not, she's not known to have EVID, right? So we want no, to not, not that she's been, Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I'm, uh, I was talking to our pulmonary pathologist. They prefer the term now. Um, what do they call it? Uh, interstitial lung disease associated with autoimmunity or autoimmune associated interstitial lung disease instead of the GLILD. But we know what you're talking about. But I, I think the usually those nodules tend to, I mean, be a little more solid and kind of smolder. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, this was uh, maybe like seven months prior. Yeah, it's, I mean, uh, it's possible, but it's, I've only seen it in the context, as Howard mentioned, of, of, of common variable immune deficiency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that the family history is kind of what, uh, of the of multiple autoimmune is what made me think of that, but yeah. Um, yeah, cool, thanks. And then here's another quick case. Uh, this is a coronary anomaly, uh, kind of a, a fun one. Uh, not quite as cool as the one Travis showed, but... Uh, um, here uh, we see a pr pretty normal looking right main, uh, and here's the left main. And what we see is that there's no circumflex coming off of the left main. Um, and instead you have this uh, vessel here that is kind of coming uh, retrograde from the uh, LAD and then entering the left AV groove and uh, supplying some part of the, the circ circumflex territory. Um, this is in an asymptomatic um, or mildly symptomatic uh, uh, middle-aged woman um, with really no past, uh, no no history of infarct. Here's the the calcium score, um, basically showing a very minimal plaque in her. Um, so I, I thought this was either going to be a, a congenital absence of the circumflex, um, which has been described mostly in the angiographic literature. Um, and there they describe a, a, a super dominant RCA, and certainly her RCA is fairly large. Um, uh, uh, but what they don't describe in that literature is what is, is the LCX coming, uh, back, uh, coming from another, another territory. So I'd entertain the possibility that this could be a, uh, chronic total occlusion of the, um, uh, circumflex with, uh, this being a collateral coming from the LAD. Uh, fortunately she had a stress perfusion, which, can pull up the splash images from that. Um, you can see very, very normal, um, uh, no, no lateral wall ischemic defect on stress or rest. Um, so yeah, uh, this is just a, a fun example of uh, some of another benign congenital variant anomaly where uh, the circumflex is, is is absent. Cool. Thank you. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you. All right, Peter. Got some time. About five, four or five minutes. All right, um, I'll show, show two two quick ones. One of the first one's just kind of a bread and butter um, case. A patient with, uh, well, here's the radiograph. Um, here's the abnormality with the cavity. You kind of see the thickening around it and a fibro, fibrocavitary lesion here. And then some other airspace facets bilaterally. And then here's the CT. So the patient's history is uh, poorly, poorly managed uh, type 1 diabetes. So he's actually mistakenly diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, but turns out he has type 1 and shows up uh, with DKA. And then here's the cavitary lesion. Oh, that's, that's nasty. Yeah. Dead lung then, hanging off of it. Yep, and then uh, all this uh, tree and bud everywhere. And you kind of see some some ground glass. So uh, five months. So this. So I'll show the CT. So he's treated, and I'll show the CT from a few months later. So this is what it looks like uh, three or four months later. And then they ended up also having a, a little back to me. But here's the diagnosis. Here's the pathology. So this is mucor. Um, so there's a big abscess from mucor. It's <laughs> wow. It's a collapsed bird's nest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the thunderstorm took it out. Yeah. So Jeff, it's like the, the wall of the cavity is just sloughing off, right? Maybe in part. 
perhaps. Kind of what it looks like, and just the you got the dead so tissue hanging out, adherent to it. Just falling inwards, as it were. Wow. Yeah. And then, and at this point, um, show the the later image. Just a lot of the inflammation is resolved, and now this is just fibrocavitary, still infected, of course, more chronic, chronic inflammation. Uh, was, I think the patient was having hemorrhage as well. Okay, and then lastly, the other one is more impressive. Uh, it was shown to me by my colleague Art Stillman yesterday. So here's the radiograph. Anyone want to guess about these bumps? Yeah, and then it, it, it's not the it's not what you would expect. So because we think we would have I would have thought this is kind of left atrial appendage pulmonary artery region. Pulmonary artery is right there. There's an abnormal bump here, but I don't think it's it's very hard to 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 get this. Uh, Prospectively, so I'm going to just go ahead and show. Has this person had surgery? Uh, has uh, no. Had... So the history is he is a power lifter. Uh, he's 58 years old and he's a power lifter and has been feeling. Uh, he goes to the gym five days a week, but he's been feeling worse recently. I think it's a pericardial defect. Pericardial defect, yeah. So let's take a look at the CT. So these were these were the most uh, impressive. Uh, so if you let's if you follow this descending aorta here, um, these are just huge aneurysms of his uh, sinus of Valsalva. So this is uh, and all three all three sinuses are massively dilated. So this is the left sinus. There's a, there's a huge thrombus, and then there's a and then there's a uh, there's a coronary artery there. And then, so these are just the other sinuses, and then they're coming down, uh, causing a bunch of mass effect on the on the atria. Oh, you're kidding! It's a case of yeah. the decade. Has anyone ever yeah. described all three sinuses like that? I mean, I've never we've never seen. I mean, this is by far the most impressive. Uh, and it's not like a root dilation. That's like a you know like a marfanoid type thing. It doesn't look like that. No, it really looks like. Three sinuses yeah. all aneurysms. That's insane. So, yeah, and you can that see is. how big this aneurysm is here with the mixing uh, slow yeah. flow. The question is, what are they going to do? Uh, yeah. They're going. In, so I looked at the chart. They're going in for surgery. Uh, they're going to. I don't know what they'll end up doing. I guess a big root uh, replacement. Root yeah. replacement. Wow. That so here's some. So, and. Uh, <laughs> is is there any occupational uh, association with with lifting weights? Well, so so I guess there are increased stress, and then obviously there's no, no. not everybody that does powerlifting does steroids, but steroids are not, anabolic steroids are not good for your uh, uh, collagen, and, and, and your, you get aneurysms and dissections, but we have no, that would just be complete speculation. Wow. It's the weirdest case I've it's seen in a long, long time. It's inexplicable. So yeah, these are just giant. Uh, yeah. That's it. All right, thanks. Well, that's a good one to end on. So uh, thanks everyone for the great cases, and we'll talk to you next week. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Cheers.